this is Raymond Blanc, one of the godfathers of cooking. Uh, and he had this bowl of peaches on his table. And you can imagine it was like one young chef's job to choose the best six peaches, right? And he grabs this peach and he looks at it and he bites into it and he's like, <laughs> and there's juice all down the table. And, you know, and he's looking at me and he goes, Gary, is there enough English food to make a language? This is Raymond Blanc. And I'm just sitting there going, huh? Hello and welcome to The Recipe, a podcast about restaurants. I'm your host, James Clasper, and this month's episode features an extended interview with industry legend Gary Dawson. Today, Gary's the general manager at Henna Kirkabu Crow, an 18th century inn on the west coast of Denmark, which boasts two Michelin stars. But that barely scratches the surface of Gary's long career in the industry. His highlights reel includes almost a decade as the head chef at the Fat Duck alongside Heston Blumenthal when it won its three Michelin stars, a long-running stint on one of the UK's most popular food programs, Ready Steady Cook, and a move to Denmark where he forged a formidable relationship with Paul Cunningham, which fellow chef Sat Baines has called one of the best in the business. I recently discussed all this with Gary in what turned out to be one of the most enjoyable interviews I've ever done. As you'll see, Gary's a natural storyteller, so my advice is to make yourself a pot of tea, find a comfy seat, and just sit back and enjoy the conversation. And whether you work in the kitchen or on the floor, or a serious foodie or a casual diner, you're in for a treat. Coming up, you'll hear how Gary broke into fine dining, how he got the job at the Fat Duck, what it was like working with Heston, why he decided to leave the kitchen to focus on front of house operations, and why he rarely eats in Michelin-starred restaurants anymore. But let's begin at the very beginning, with Gary's first job in a kitchen at a fancy hotel in southern England, not far from where he grew up. I was 13 and I said, I want to cook. At the school I was at, uh, when you made your choices of which education to go down, I chose catering because I thought, this is, this is what I want to do. Now, a reaction to that was, you have to go on your work experience, this work placement, to a catering establishment. So I went to the best hotel in the area, which was called Penny Hill Park. And I was there for a week in the still room making tea and coffee with a fucking bow tie on, right? Because they just didn't understand I wanted to be a chef. So it was at the end of the week, I went up to the head chef and I grabbed him and his name was David Richards. I mean, this is like, it was a stereotypical chef. And I remember going up to him saying, excuse me, chef, excuse me. Um, I'm, there's a mistake. I really should be in the kitchen. And he just gave me loads of abuse. You know, like, you can't come in the kitchen. Who do you think you are? Da, da, da. But then he spoke to the, the guy that was in charge of me. And sure enough, he came back to me and he said, you start school holidays in the next couple of weeks. I went, yeah. He said, come and work. So I did. So I spent actually most of my school holidays working in a kitchen, just learning stuff, just being in the environment. And that environment, to be in a kitchen, I mean, Tom's got it right. Tom Kerridge, when he calls them pirates, right? You know, they, they worked all day. They, they partied all night. You know, they were fighting, you know, it was verbal. It was, it was, it was everything you just looked at. You went, my God, this is incredible. It's an amazing environment to be passionate about. So that was it. So yes, that was why I was like, this is definitely right for me. And I'm sticking with it. Now, obviously the next step from there was the best hotel Beyond there was a place called Clifton House. And that was like, wow. You know, Charlie Chaplin used to stay there. Winston Churchill used to stay there. I was like, this has got to be the place to go, right? And it's got a Michelin star, this Michelin star, right? Now, obviously, when you go there, they've got this, this small kitchen, which is actually in the basement next to the snooker room, which is the very small restaurant for the Michelin. And you go in and the, the head chef, he, he, he'd call you in and then he would say, okay, so you want to work for me? And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Ron Maxfield was his name. Uh, again, another incredible figure. He said, you want to work for me? And you're like, yeah. He goes, okay. So he puts you down in the Michelin kitchen where they work for dinner, Tuesday to Saturday only. And it's like 25 people. And it's just idyllic. It's calm. They were treated like rock stars amongst the rest of the kitchen. And they could walk around and cherry pick ingredients. From the rest of the ingredients, you know, uh, baby carrots, I'll come and take, oh, they look nice. I'll have the six ones, the best six you've got. So they were like the gods. They came in at two o'clock every day, suntanned, you know, uh, and the head chef was like, hey, you guys, what have you been up to today? They went, well, you know, we've been playing football and then, you know, went to the gym and then now we're here, chef. And good lads, well, you've got 15 covers tonight. 
we're on the we're on the meat section on the veg section you know just looking ill and dead and we've been working crazy you know? and then after a week he says is that what you want and you're like yeah it's exactly what i want cool so you need to come into the main kitchen and work your nuts off for a year and if you're good enough if you're good enough you can get down there i was like okay cool so i went and started and you know i worked there for in total i think four years after a year i got into the michelin loved that feeling of you know this is special and then he gave me sous chef so i came out of the kitchen out of the michelin kitchen back up to the main kitchen where basically i was employed to shout that was my role with shouting you know it wasn't like abuse it was just like uh, being a, a manager of a football pitch at the side there. He's always shouting. It's not abuse but he's shouting, you know. Are we ready for lunch? You know, it's just like, yeah, you know, are, the, is, are we ready in the staff canteen for the staff food? Are we ready? Oh, blah, 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 blah. And if I wasn't shouting, he'd come out of the office sometimes and go, Gary, I can't hear you. You know, it was just like a football manager. It was crazy. I spent four years there and then I felt that it was time to shake things up. And I went and worked for a friend of mine, which was a complete disaster. I mean, complete disaster. But you know what? It got me out of my comfort zone. So then I'm in this position where I'm looking around. And it was at that point, then I said uh, to a friend of mine, oh, I'm looking around for a job. And he goes, oh, I've heard a couple of crazy things. And I ended up going for an interview with Heston at the Fat Duck. And I remember distinctly the whole interview process. I could t talk for an hour about that process. But basically, I can remember meeting him and then... I worked with him for a, a day. Then we sat in this office upstairs, which is like a complete. Imagine if you took Albert Einstein, Alan Ducasse, and maybe the Trago brothers, and then you shook it up and just spread it out onto a table, right? That's what this, this, this office was like. And I'm like, mm hmm. And he talked to me for about half an hour, maybe 45 minutes. I didn't understand a word he was saying. I mean, he's talking to me about food and I've just come from Michelin and I've, I've spent at that point, you know, a good stint of my life in high class hotels. And there's this guy that I've never really heard of. Rumors that he was friends with Marco, you know, um, blah, 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 blah. And I've never heard of this guy. And yet he's talking about things like petit salé, andouillette, jus gras, you know, pig's ear reduction. And I'm like, and I'm just sitting there and I'm, I'm going, hmm, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I agree. I have a fucking clue what he was talking about. And I remember leaving that, that, that meeting, went home, next day came back, worked another day. And I said to my girlfriend, now my wife, I have to work for this guy because I have no clue what he's on about. I need to know what he knows. So I took the job and it, we, was, we were like three in the kitchen. It was ridiculous, you know, and everyone there was a proper pirate. I mean, you know, non-educated. I was the first educated guy I'd ever employed. And I walked in and I'm just like, uh, okay, well, we can't do that. And we can't do that. And we can't do that. We shouldn't be doing that. And that's definitely not legal. And he's like, okay, well, I didn't know this. You know, he's just worked uh, randomly in kitchens. And then we started this most uh, amazing relationship, which went on for like nearly 10 years, which was, you know, phenomenal. And just to remind me what you came in as? I came in as a head chef. There was a couple of other guys there, but, you know, no one with any real, at the time, any real, you know. And that was the run when it started getting Michelin stars, right? Yeah. Well, when I joined, we had nothing. I missed, I think, about the first six to eight months. I think I missed something like that. You know, so when I went, he had a couple of bodies in the kitchen, but, you know, nothing really crazy, really. And then I joined and then, yeah, it took, I think, about two, three years before we got our first star. Then we got our second star and then we got our third in 2004, I believe. And yeah, so, you know, we went through the, all the emotions of TV, doing filming for that, Discovery Channel. You know, suddenly people that we, I've been watching all my life on TV suddenly come into the restaurant and just talking to us like we're normal. You know, funnily enough, the, the day I met Heston, I said I'll take the job. But what I also said to him was, Heston, I have an interview at the Manoir with Raymond Blanc, which I'd already said yes to. And I thought it was the right thing to do was to continue with that. Just so I knew 100%. Heston said, hey, go for it. I understand. I went to the, the Manoir, had, funnily enough, the most bizarre uh, interview with Raymond Blanc. I remember it to this day. It was the most passionate insanely beautiful interview I've ever had. We sat in his office. He'd showed me round. While he was showing me round, we walked through the gardens and there were some ladies having like afternoon tea at a table with an umbrella. And then one of the umbrellas was slightly skewed. And without a, missing a beat, he ran away from me. Like, and he grabs this umbrella. And he's like, I'm oh, not ladies. This is a mistake. No, and, you know, and he's pulling, he's pulling this umbrella and it's just getting worse. 
And then he leaves it completely wonky, upside down, we'd spilt the tea. And the ladies are just like, oh my God, it's Raymond Blum. Oh, oh. Like this. And then we walked away and he was like, that is it. That was it. That was the, that was the thing. And you see a gardener come running over, put it back correctly. You know, and, but I, I, and I think at that moment, I sort of realized that guest interaction is critical, right? Guests want to feel the passion from the guy, right? doesn't matter if it's the best interaction, but it's the interaction. And then we sat in his office, Raymond Blanc's office, and he's got this uh, fruit bowl. You can, and it was like, this is Raymond Blanc, one of the godfathers of cooking. Uh, and he had this bowl of peaches on his table. And you can imagine it was like one young chef's job to choose the best six peaches, right? And he grabs this peach and he looks at it and he bites into it and he's like, <laughs> and there's juice all down the table. And, you know, and he's looking at me and he goes, Gary, is there enough English food to make a language. And this is Raymond Blanc. And I'm just sitting there going, huh? This peach is a language. Look at it. And he's, well, I, I remember leaving there like, wow. I mean, the guy is crazy. In a good way. In a good way. But what am I going to learn here? I could see in the kitchen there was 20 people. And I'm coming in, you know, uh, what am I going to learn here? Or I work for this guy called Heston, where I'm next to him. I'm working right next to this guy and can take everything that he's got and hopefully give something back. So I took the job with Heston, which honestly, the people thought I was crazy when I said I was going to work for Heston. They're like, who? So I started working for him and I worked with him for the nine years, nine, 10 years, did all the things with the, you know, the TV and all that stuff that we did, which was brilliant, real learning curve. But in that process, I was also learning that because the kitchen was open, I realized that us interacting with the guests was the best thing ever. Right. So then I started looking beyond. I sometimes come out of the kitchen and look beyond and make sure that what we were doing, and this was something that Heston was equally engaged in, was that we would spend ages, and this is where I think a lot of chefs fall down, is you could spend ages developing something, put it on a plate. And from a kitchen point of view, perfect. At that one minute, perfect. And then they give it to a waiter. And it could be the construction of a dish could be precarious it's ridiculous it's like an eiffel tower of something and you put it in front of the waiter and you go perfect and then they walk two yards it falls over and then they come back and they either get shouted at or abused or whatever you know this was what kitchen did back then so what happened next time he didn't come back it would fall over and he would just put it in front of you who loses out the guest right so you got to think how do we interact with the front of the house and then how do they interact with the guest and the guest is the most important thing that we got here so therefore I started looking beyond. How do we make sure that the food that we put on the plate has two or three minutes or maybe four minutes, depending on what the dish was, of longevity before it got to the guest. And, and when we put it on a plate, like a piece of fish, it's going to continue cooking for another three or four minutes. And then obviously back then there was no Instagram and all that stuff, but people would sit there and go, well, what have you got? Oh, I've got the fish. Oh yeah, you got that? Yeah. You know, and talk and then start to eat. So every time we took a dish and we made it, we put it on a plate. We sent it when, and practicing this, we'd put it on the pass. No, wait. Okay, and we'd say to the restaurant manager at the time, whoever that may be, he would take it to the restaurant and put it on an empty table. You know, it's the middle of the day, put it on an empty table. On a Monday, probably, no one in the restaurant. Put it on the table, sit there and we'd look at it and just pretend to talk. And then we'd eat it. Oh, it's overcooked. Oh, okay, shit, back we go again. Right, take it back another 30, you know, 30 seconds, a minute. You know, everything was so calculated to how we could get it to you. And that's when I realized that everything is important. It's not just about food. It's about the chair you're sitting. It's about the table. It's the curtains. It's what's in your eye line. It's what's behind you. It's what your wife's going to be looking at. What's going to be distracting her when you talk, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's very, very important. The whole dynamic. Working with Heston, we learned about music in the room, what kind of music you should have, you know, and if you think about restaurants, Fast food chains, the music quite up tempo, if there is any, but nowadays not so many, but it used to be a bit more up tempo and a restaurant was very much more, you know, relaxed. These are very conscious decisions made by the people, the restaurateurs that built these franchises or whatever. So we started to learn this. The chair that you're sitting has got to be so comfortable. But again, when you go to the fast food chains, the chairs are not so comfortable because they don't want you to stick around, eat out, get out. You right? So these are things that I started to learn. And that was the transition between when I thought about not leaving the kitchen, but doing more than just the kitchen. Because I'd cooked then, you know, for years at that point. 
And obviously I was working with someone who was incredibly passionate and we had achieved so many great things. But I was realizing that, you know, there's some amazing cooks out there. You know, Sat Baines and Claude Boosie, you know, these, these guys are just fucking legends, right? And will always be legends. And when you look at some of these guys, you go, hmm, know your limitations, Gary. Know your limitations, right? And move on. Complete the picture, which is why then we had a small brasserie, Heston and I. We had a couple of other partners. Um, one of them was the uh, football player, Lee Dixon. And, and it was a brasserie on the River Thames. And we were running it at the same time as the duck. And it was good and it was bad. It was up, it was down. We had staffing issues like everybody else. But it was super cool environment. And it meant that we learned a different side to the duck. And then when, when my first son was born, it was like, shit, this is totally different. I've got to rethink my life here because, you know, you know what it's like, right? You, it changes you. So I said to Heston, listen, this little restaurant we have down the road, I want it. So whatever we need to do to make that happen, make it happen. So we did that. So I took over, Heston came out, and then I ran it with the other guys that we were already partnership with um, for the next sort of four years. And then learned even more about people, you know, visibility, running a restaurant, running staff, you know, all the crap that goes wrong when you're running a staff, internet connections, credit card machines, all that crap, you know. And then my second son was born. And again, it was like, hang on a minute, change again, right? It's like, shit. Uh, this is not, I, I need to do something different. Now, my wife being Danish, she, she never said we need to move to Denmark. It'd been playing in my mind that we should go at some point. The Danes have an amazing relationship with work and family life. And I just said it out loud one day. I was like, maybe it's time we should go to Denmark. Just try. And she's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah. And there was, there was obviously there's some great chefs in Denmark, but this is... 12 years ago, 13 years ago, it wasn't as crazy as now, right? So I'm like, yeah, I really want to go. Why not? Yeah, let's do it. Took a little while to figure out what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go. I had a few interviews with some people that are established here in Denmark. To be honest, it became very quickly known to me that they wanted Gary Fat Duck. They didn't want me. They wanted to know what I knew. Right. And, and maybe that's normal. Maybe that's, you know, exp, you know, listen, if I employed, if I was a mechanic for Ferrari and then I had this geezer come in and he said he'd been working for McLaren and he was winning the championship, I'd probably want to know why and how. Right. So it's probably quite normal. But they, 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 it wasn't always that open about it. So I was like, no, nah, I'm not sure if that's right. Then there was um, a friend of mine who said there's a brilliant hotel going to reopen, been closed for a while. It's been refurbished. They need a head chef. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I've been sort of semi out of the kitchen for a few years, but maybe I should go back in the kitchen. So I did that just for a year. But the funny thing is, while I was there, I got an email and I was in a real, I wasn't in a rut, but it was, it was, I was like, it was a big hotel and there was a lot of crap that went with it. Lots of meetings, lots of, you know, people sitting around going, oh, blah, 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 blah. and I'm sitting there going, why am I sat here? I want to be in the kitchen. I want to do work with these boys. And I'd go to the office and answer the hundred emails that came every day about rubbish, you know. And, and then one of the emails just said, call me. And I'm like, ooh, ah, delete. So I deleted it. I think a couple of days later, I got another email that said, please call me. Deleted that as well. You know, and then I'm like, you know, carried on, you know. And then I got another email saying, you really should call me. Called the number. Turns out it was uh, the guy I work for now, Fleming Scoble. And he's like, I've got a cool project and I'd like you to come and have a look at it. All right, okay. So literally, I think the next morning I met with him and his brief was really small. He's like, I want to have a great restaurant. I want it to be one of the best. How are we going to do it? And I went, oh, interesting. That's yeah, really, really cool. Yeah, well, I need to see the restaurant. I don't know where I was going. I didn't have a near clue. And that's when he said, okay, West Coast, Henneke, we're cool. Go and have a look. So I went out there and that, and that was this long drive to the West Coast from where I lived. And it was just like, oh my God, the most idyllic, beautiful cottage restaurant on the roadside. It was everything you could possibly imagine. And I ain't got to say, I went in there thinking to have a look, thinking, oh, well, 
I've just come from one of the best restaurants in the world. You know, I'll buy Riddell glasses and I'll get some Urquhui cutlery and I'll get some um, um, Limoges crockery that we, you know, let's buy all this amazing stuff, lift it instantly, and then we'll just suddenly become great. When I walked in the door, they had everything already. It was just like, oh my God. Oh, hang on. Is that, oh, yeah, 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 I have got this. And you got plus, you had like things like Royal Copenhagen, you know, beautiful Danish fucking, you know, quality. And I'm like, oh, hmm, this could actually be, this could be really challenging. I'll tell you what the biggest thing I did in the early stage, right? In the early stage, the biggest thing I did was brought the kitchen and the front of house together because they weren't talking. They were this classic kitchen's always right. The front of house are always idiots. You know, there was this restaurants. This is what I, you know, you guys are a bunch of idiots, you know, even though they don't mean it, even though they actually, you know, they, they love each other. There's always this where well, you're in front of the guest, So you must be wrong. And I'm in the kitchen and I'm always right. So I had to bring these, these, these two elements together and make us one. And that's what we did, I think, quite successfully. And I really like that. Fast forward a couple of years to 2012, I got called to a meeting by Fleming Scoble and Simon Scoble, his son, where we sat at a table and I had all these notes, but I didn't know what we were going to talk about. And they looked at me and they just said, we need to make a change. And I'm like, hmm, yep, okay. And I'm thinking, you know, that millisecond when you're thinking, that's me. I'm out, you know, type thing. And I was, I was really loving what we were doing because there was, there was no boundaries. It was just do the best we could. And I said, okay, what do you got in mind? And they said, we need another chef. And I was like, oh, and then obviously this threw me and I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. Mm, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. We, you know, listen, we've gone to Nordic. The food was very Nordic. There was like uh, probably 10, 12 chefs in the kitchen tweezers everywhere it was a bit like you know okay you know it's silence i mean silence if you if you turn around and like banged a, a cupboard everyone's like, Shh. It, was like it was it was horrendous in that sense i come from a kitchen where we played music right you know heston and i we got shut down by the neighbors because we we're singing neil diamond at the top of our lungs like you know stupid o'clock in the morning it was so loud i tell you this is so loud and this is a true story we we're singing you know um sweet carolina right and a neighbor complained they tried to ring the kitchen phone which bear in mind was just here it was next to us couldn't hear it he came out of his house around the corner he came in the front door he came in the kitchen and pressed stop on the on the cd machine you know and we're like what, what what's your problem he goes i've been trying to tell you it's really loud and i can hear you singing you know like five doors down so we we love music and we, we we played music all the time and it was part of what we you know what we did so have this kitchen that was silent was killing me anyway in this conversation with Fleming and Simon, it's like, they go, yeah, so what do you think? Now, this was also, if I remember rightly, January, and we closed in the, back then, I think we closed in the October or November, and we were due to open in the March. And then they suddenly say, yeah, we need a new head chef. Um, what do you think? And I only had one person in my mind. It was beautiful, but at the same time, hit and miss. I have no idea if this would work. And they said, okay, what are you thinking? And I said, well, Paul Cunningham is the guy I want to work with. And they went, what do you mean, Paul from The Paul? I went, yeah, the restaurant, the, the, the non-egotistically named restaurant in Copenhagen called The Paul. And, and, and they're like, but you know Paul? And I went, yeah, I know Paul. Now, the reason I knew Paul is because when we thought about moving to Denmark, my wife being Danish, she's, she's a... Uh, she was in recruitment, so she was very active on the, you know, uh, okay, if you want to do something, this is how you do it. Blah, blah, blah. She, so she just got on the phone and just called Paul up. Said, Paul, hi, uh, you don't know me. My name's Hella Dawson. I'm married to Gary Dawson, and uh, he works at the Fat Duck. And uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, we want to move to Denmark. Is it easy? Is it difficult? How should we do that type thing? Then when I moved to Denmark, we started texting and ringing each other, and we we, we talked a lot. So when I called him and just said, hey, Paul, I've just left a meeting. What are you doing? And he was like, oh, I don't know. Uh, thought about writing a book, you know, thought I might do some photography. To, I went, okay, well, the restaurant's closed, right? And he went, yeah, because he just suffered a blood clot in his shoulder and was recovering from that. So at that point, he said, stress, I'm, I'm quitting the pool. So he left. So he was doing nothing. And I sort of knew this. So, okay, listen, we've got this amazing project. Come and see what we're doing. No strings attached. Just come and see what we're doing. He went, yeah, okay. 
I walked back into the meeting with the family and I said, listen, guys, I've just spoke to Paul. He's up for a meeting. So let's let's get together. So I, I took him, first of all, to our island. I say our, of course, it's theirs, but, you know, I, I feel I have some, you know, a little bit of ownership on it. So we have this island, a privately owned island in Denmark and where we have game and, you know, it's the most amazingly architecturally, uh, naturistic, beautiful place. It's incredible. I took him there first, showed him around. Now, I'm not kidding you. It's nothing like Buckingham Palace. But if I threw you into the middle of Buckingham Palace and showed you around, you'd be like, Right. So it's showed him around and he was like, oh, my God. I said, right now, let's get in the car and let's go to the restaurant. Now, hour and a half away, jump in the car. We speak for an hour and a half talking. And, and the, the more time we actually spend together, we realized the more alike we are. You know, we looked at the same chefs growing up. We worked in the same way. We had the same taste about food, uh, you know, food being food. You know, we loved things like foie gras. You know what I mean? We loved caviar. All these things we loved. Back then, I called it like dirty cooking, you know, roasting butter and, you know, basting and just finishing. And it's just, it was great. It was like proper old school cooking as opposed to everything being too clean and plain, right? So then we got to the restaurant, showed him around the restaurant. Now, he'd come from the Paul, and obviously the Paul was a beautiful build on the outside. But from my understanding, and I've seen it afterwards, the kitchen was pretty crappy. And he couldn't do it 100% the way he wanted to do it. So when he came to the West Coast and I showed him, a kitchen and he went wow kitchen's amazing i said yeah but this is just to make breakfast we got another kitchen over on the other side and then it took him to the other side and he went, oh, well, you know and he was just i think overwhelmed but in a good way and i think he could see potential in all of this then he went away we talked about it again he came back then with his team the guys that he used to work with now paul has an amazing following of chefs which have gone on to do their own things now. But back then when he was in Copenhagen, he just had to say, guys, I'm going to the other end of the country. Who's coming? We will. Yeah, we're coming. So they came over, showed them around. It's like, great, let's do it. And I think within three or four weeks, we opened for the season. And then we, that was 2012. And then obviously, yeah, as you can tell from there to where we are today, you know, two stars in the Michelin Guide, I think we've done quite a lot, but I think the, the biggest thing that we're doing is just championing real food. Paul's cooking doesn't require the most amazingly perfect baby carrots or everything to be the same. You know, Paul's food is a bit ugly in that sense. You know, it's beautifully ugly. And so I think, you know, we've got something there on the West Coast that is just unique, you know, and that's one of the most beautiful things about Paul. He is unique. We work together so well. He brings an energy. He brings class. And this is the beautiful thing that chefs should listen to and learn. And I don't think a lot of them do. And that is, in the morning, you can have a menu, you can have a dish, you can have a sauce, you can have a garnish. The important thing here is, is that every single day, it changes. Now, if you've got a, a set a recipe that never moves, that's fine. Because it'll be great every day. However, there's certain days it should be amazing, Right. And it should change in accordance with many factors. Now, I've always put this down to the, the, the weather, but it's, it's more than that. But basically, imagine Paul leaves his little house on the side of the restaurant, right? And it's probably about a five minute. Paul walks pretty slow. So it's about five minutes, right? At a good pace, maybe three, right? But the point is, in that three minutes, he will walk from his house and he'll go past the sheep and he'll go through the garden, past the uh, orchard where the flowers are, and he'll go past the bees and he might divert if it's a beautiful day to take a picture up into the garden and you can see beyond into the meadow. And then he'll swing around a little bit and then end up coming back down towards the restaurant. Now, in all those moments, he's absorbing the temperature. He's absorbing the feel. He's absorbing the nature. And what will happen is when he walks in the kitchen on that given day, he might turn around to the boys and say, we're going to lighten the sauce a bit today or we're going to add a bit more. It's a bit cold outside. We add a little extra butter, right? We're going to make that, take it down just a little bit and a knob of butter. And then because we're going to do that, we're just going to add a bit more salt. We just need to make it more punchy. On a summer's day, we're going to lighten it a bit, a bit more acidity, a little bit more lemon juice in there or uh, mm, uh, apple cider, whatever. Bum, 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 bum. It's that daily adjustment that makes the difference, right? It's the little bit of spice, a little bit of magic. You can't run a kitchen like bum, 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 bum all the time. 
And that's what he does phenomenally well, right? And if that means that he walks in one day and he just says, nah, I've just seen the apple trees and all the apples have fallen off. You know, the bees are just eating all the apples and it's just a bit miserable outside. We're not going to do apple crumble today. Then that's what he does. That's how he, that's how he operates. And that is magical. You know, absolutely magical. I was talking to another friend of mine. We have some crazy conversations and we spent a few hours on the phone the other day and we were talking about how being rigid to your, to your thoughts, being stuck in the procedure, having these steps that are concreted in every day because you're trying to keep a feeling, keep a, uh, an award, keep a Michelin star, keep all these things that you've got to keep because you're so afraid to lose them. He was like, when we do this, and we create an environment where everything's written down. We lose creativity. We lose uh, a feeling. It's no longer an art. It's just a process. It's a thing. And that's sad, right? Now, we've all been part of that. You know, the, the, this is Heston I'm talking about. You know, we talk a lot about this and how, in his mind, the things that he's been doing, he doesn't always agree with. You know, The Fat Duck, Dinner by Heston Blumenthal. Many fancy pantsy restaurants have got these regimes where no one can go wrong because what's important is consistency. Now, consistency is great for winning awards, but it's boring as hell for people that work there, right? And when I was younger cooking, the sous chef on any given day could say, hey, guys, today, fuck, the chickens didn't come in, so we're going to change it, we're going to do pigeon. You know, or we're going to change the sauce up because the fucking we, we, we didn't get any, we didn't get the chicken wings in to make the sauce for the chicken. So we're going to change it up here. That was the, that was that was what was expected of the chef was to change things. You know, but when I was younger, it was like a knock on the back door, and then the guy would come in and go, oh, "Hello, I'm selling truffles," huh? and you go, "Brilliant! Fuck, what are we going to do today? Truffles, guys. We're going to make a new, uh, just do a new dish. Put some truffles on. Doesn't matter. That's gone, right? If I can't order over the phone." pristine little baby fish this big or monkfish this big or you know a cod this big then and in the morning when it doesn't arrive everyone goes oh my god oh no what are we gonna do now right it's it's horrible I, I, and, and that for me is is lost now i don't go out and eat michelin restaurants very often anymore because of that you know i, I like to go somewhere where i can i can look at a plate and i can go i know uh, yeah i can see that the guy in the kitchen there He's either having a bad day or a good day. He's struggling or he's happy or he's sad. You can feel it on the plate. Now, I don't care if I go somewhere, my steak is slightly overcooked. But if I can still feel that it's got that little bit of seasoning on it, if it's seasoned correctly, you know, and it's a bit of love. If I can see that I get this steak, beautiful ribeye, and it's been roasted and it's crispy on the outside, a little bit overcooked, but it's got thyme, it's got rosemary, it's got garlic. And the guy's taking comfy garlic that he roasted it with and he smushed it over the top. And I eat that steak and I taste it and I go, this guy was thinking about it. He cared about it. Is it overcooked? Well, it might be. But do I really care? No. Because I can taste his passion. I can taste his love for what he's doing, right? The rest of it will come later, right? But anyone can pick up a book now and get a, a, a water bath and a thermometer and cook a steak perfectly to medium rare. But it doesn't mean it's seasoned. It doesn't mean it's finished correctly. That's what is so goddamn annoying about cooking today, you know? And that's what we've been talking about. How and what should we do next to make food fun and interesting? And this is what Paul does, hands down. And this is what we do as a group on the West Coast, right? This is something that is quite, it's not controversial, but what's important to me is that henna on the West Coast is not about one person. It's not about Paul. It's not about me. It's not about the family that, that owns the place. It's about everybody. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody has um, a feeling. Everybody has an eye. And everybody should be a part of that. And it's because everybody has this that we can, you know, create something that's a little bit different. On any given day, something can go completely left or right. No problem. It's how we deal with it. And we try to give people the tools in henna. Uh, the restaurant staff, the kitchen, the gardener, the, the lady who does the flowers. We try to give everybody the tools to make a decision for themselves with knowing the fact that they can actually do it. And no one's going to go, well, that's not like it was yesterday. What the hell is that? You know, everything can change on a given day. And I think we're losing that a little bit in the industry, unfortunately. 
It's really fascinating to hear how you empower everyone in that way. But I'm also interested in how you've brought all your uh, your years of experience in the kitchen to bear on both the front of house and the back of house teams. A very simple example is the previous chef to Paul used to love folding napkins really quite high. And then on top of that would be the most precarious little, little uh, caviar tin, um, which had a caviar dish in there that was compiled of 100 million pieces of, of stuff. And then it was balanced on top of this napkin and then a waiter had to carry two of these into the restaurant. And there was always a mistake. Something always fell off on them. And, and it was, it, I think it was someone like me that could come in and say, guys, listen, this just doesn't work. I'm just saying you can't do this. I mean, who's suffering? You're going to have to replate the dish. They're going to have to recarry it again. Everyone was a little bit scared of the kitchen, you know? And so I had to be in the position where I could say to the kitchen, think differently about this guys right let's change the fucking napkin right if you want to do the dish the way you're doing the dish no problem but let's change the way we present it and i had to say to the front of the house as well guys listen you cannot be afraid of the kitchen we're in this together if one of it's not working then it's not going to work for everyone i've never had any kind of routine in my life don't get me wrong it's not like every wednesday we get together and nine o'clock we drink coffee and have croissants and discuss the week ahead no but it'd just be like when we needed to as often as we needed to could be five minutes here, could be 10 minutes there. Try to get people together a little bit, sort of like the leaders. Say, listen, guys, you know, listen, you got to agree that if he says this, that he means it out of love and passion, not because he thinks you're an idiot. And so slowly but surely, people started to understand that there's one goal here, and that's to give the customer at the table the best experience, right? Paul has a good saying, but he says, happy cooks, you know, happy food, right? And that's true. Then that happy food gets taken out to a guest. Now, a guest has to be happy, right? Now, the food can be the best in the world, but the most important thing, we have to read the situation, right? Because we've got to make sure that happy food gets to the table and makes guests happy. But we've got to read the situation. We've got to then look at every single... I am not a waiter, but and this is where waiters get really quite frustrated with me because when I go to a table, I'm not going to go to the right of the guest and put it down if it's awkward. If it's two guests sitting like this, I'll just go in and go, there you go, chicken, right? And smile and, and I'll look at the situation. Do they want to hear more? Do they want to see more? What kind of people are they? When I walk to the table, do they look at me waiting? What's he going to say? In which case, I'll give a bit more. If they're still holding hands when I walk up to the table and go to lean in and they're not still holding hands and they're still talking, they don't want to hear what I've got to say. They want to keep it short and sweet. So we put it down and I go, chicken, walk away, right? And if they want to hear more on the next course, then we'll explain more. But we got to read the situation. And that was where the front of house had to be more comfortable with the kitchen so that they knew that when they went to the table to the guests, they weren't going to get called out by the chef for saying, did you present it correctly? Who cares, right? Who cares? It's about presenting it in the best way for the guest. The ones that sit there and look at you and they want to go, well, this is a chicken that was raised by Jeff. Now, Jeff loves his chickens, you know, and he can tell them the whole bloody story. No big deal. But you got to read the guest. And that's where I think I brought to Henna from my kitchen experience to the guest experience was bringing the two together so that everyone was happy so they could communicate to the guest in the best possible way. You know. OK, so tell me, how do you think you've changed in 20, 25 years in this business? I think what I've um, what I've tried to realise, I think, over the years is that the most important thing we have is people. And what I try to do, which is a bit ironic considering, you know, we've been talking for about an hour and probably I've done about an hour and 10 of that, but you know, is that you need to listen, right? And you need to try and, you need to try and make the environment the best it can be. Because then when people leave or people move on or things change, you can put your hand on your heart and know that you've done the best you can for yourself and for them. And is there anything that you once believed firmly about the world of restaurants that you've since changed your mind about? Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, I believed that it was just about food on a plate. That was it. And I believed that kitchens were uh, um, uh, a brutal place. And that's changed. It's not. It doesn't have to be. You know, and it's not just about the food on the plate. It's about everything, you know. And as we talked about, that comes from the people, you know. So... I, I honestly probably felt that the yeah when I was younger the front of house were just plate carriers and now I know they're not you know they're the absolute critical link between the kitchen and the front 
Now, I can't let you go without hearing about your time on Ready Steady Cook, uh, which I grew up watching, of course. I mean, it's one of the OGs of Foo TV, isn't it? I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It was actually Hester and I had to say thank you for that because, you know, he, he was approached by an agency, a management agency, and they said, listen, we're looking for new up-and-coming talent. Who do you know, anybody? And he was, yeah, I know someone. And I just finished with him and gone to the other restaurant that we had together, you know. It was cool. So he was like, yeah, go and see Gary. And I met with these people and they said, yeah, come along. And i got to tell you, right, at the time, I often thought of Ready Steady Cook as a bit of a joke, being from Michelin background, right? I thought, oh, you know, this could be a, now I've got my own restaurant. And this brings publicity. I could see that from all the years with Heston. Just a little thing on the TV brings huge amounts of people, right? That can mean the difference between survival and dying, okay? So I thought, yeah, this could be quite cool. And then maybe it'll lead on to something else. So I said, thinking it would be quite easy to the team. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I can do Ready Steady Cook. I'll do that. They said, okay, let's have an interview. So I had to go for an interview at the studios where they literally gave me a bag of ingredients like they do on the show. I'm in the studio of Ready Steady Cook with the empty audience and the cameras and everything just there. And then there's the woman who runs the show. She just go with a big bag of ingredients and go, there you go. Click, off you go. 20 minutes. Boom. And do it. Now, I had a, a little assistant with me who would have been my guest, you know, helping me out. And I had to come up with four or five dishes in, in 20 minutes, you know, and that was my interview. And I've got to say, I was like, holy shit, this is hard. And it was hard. And then I realized that what I thought was a bit of a joke, was, actually, this is fucking difficult. This is real. You know, I learned a lot in that period of time. I learned how to say things in a nice way. I learned how to sort of interact a little bit with the guest again, which was what I was doing anyway. As a, but you had that sort of that little the difference between connecting with these old ladies on the front row, you know, who are sitting there knitting, you know what I mean, looking at what you're doing and you connect with them. It means to me the difference between winning and losing, right? Which goes back to what we're talking about today in the restaurant. You know, we can connect with our guests. It's the difference between winning and losing. So it was fun. I had a lot of laughs doing it and it was real. That's the important thing. It was real. Okay, final question then. Tell me about the upcoming season at Hannah. We're doing things slightly differently this year. We've had to change the way our roles are slightly in the in the restaurant because of situations that are out of our control. Um, it's difficult to explain, but basically Paul has, you know, he's not been well the last couple of years. The good news is he's better than ever, but we have to look after him. So we are sort of relying on more on his creative content and creative input than his physical input. The uh, head chef under Paul, Paul Prophet, who's been like a complete, you know, uh, rock in the kitchen, a milestone in the kitchen, who, let's face it, most great Heston had me um, sat, you know, has got his, uh, you know, his, his, his guys there. Claude has a great head chef, you know, they all do. They have a great guy behind them, right? And and under under um, Paul has been Paul, Paul Prophet. And that's what we are sort of progressing down the lines of, that Senior can have much more of a vocal uh, input than a physical one. Um, we're not going to lose any of the charm from Paul because he's still going to be there. When I sort of want him um, to sit and shoot the breeze with me, you know, some of the best conversations we ever have is when we sit and drink tea at the front of the restaurant, you know, just shooting the breeze. And out of a great conversation come great ideas. I, I, I need that from Paul. Um, and that's where we're going to sort of change things a little bit different. So spring in Henna is going to be uh, light. It's going to be fun. It's going to be tasty. That's it. That was Gary Dawson, General Manager at Henna Kickaboo Crow. And that's also all we've got time for this month. In next month's episode, we go back to school to find out how Noma's Mad Academy is changing the world, one restaurant at a time. One of the nicest quotes we had was from a woman who said that she came in in the morning thinking that this was a luxury, and she left at the end of the day thinking this is essential. The recipe is written, produced, and hosted by me, James Clasper, for Superb. Many thanks again for listening and see you next time.